We read stories about things that happened on these hills that God guided and directed to make this a place that is remarkable. On these hills, Israelites would have entered into the promised land as they would have come into the place that God had promised them on the outskirts of Egypt and moving in. This was one of the places that God put them into. One of the the tribes that had this area was the tribe of Judah. And as they moved in and, and settled in, they had these cities like Bethlehem. And in this city of Bethlehem, you would have people like Jesse, Uh, Jesse is somebody maybe we're not as familiar with, but uh, his grandmother certainly is a name that we are more recognized, that's more recognizable. See, on these hills also Ruth would have come with Naomi. And this is where they claim that Boaz's fields actually were. Where Ruth came from the outskirts of a Moabite woman who came into a central part of the story of Scripture As she gleans on these hillsides, as her relationship with Boaz develops, she moves from the outskirts into the central part of the story. Their union produces life, and Jesse is their grandchild, and even more famously than who he is, is his grandson, that we are uh, fun, uh, that everybody, (laughs) I think, in our culture is familiar with. And that is a young shepherd boy who probably roamed these hills too, playing his harp, killing wild beasts by the name of David. And even though he was on the outskirts of his family, the youngest of the men, the last to be chosen, the last to be thought of, of being the rightful king, there's prophecy in Isaiah about this going to happen. You see, in Isaiah 11, 1 through 2, it says this, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And so it's unremarkable to look at. But when you understand the history of that place and the people who walked on that hillside, it becomes such a remarkable place. People like Abraham, Ruth, Jesse, David. Different times, but the same theme in the same place. This is also that Isaiah passage is a prophecy that foretells of something else that would happen 600 years later. When in the outside of this small town of Bethlehem, the central spotlight of all of history is spotlighted and marked by a star in the sky. The angels in the sky proclaim the Messiah is here. And a baby being born to a young woman who also has that same story of being on the outskirts, but being moved closer and closer to the central story by a God who sees her, who cares about her, who puts her in this place to be part of an experience of community, of connection, of knowing the Messiah intimately. And so we see this repeated over and over again from the edge of the story to the center of history. And so when Mary gives birth to this little boy named Jesus, the Messiah, God with us, on these hillsides, Jesus could have walked as well. He could have roamed as, as at some point, and we know as an adult, he definitely does. As he's traveling back and forth, as he's going around the, store, the city, as his life and his ministry are playing out, someone who he himself is at points on the edge of society, they have to run and flee to Egypt. He comes in, he has to go to Nazareth, this border town where nobody cares about what's happening there. Before he begins his ministry, he moves closer and closer to where these hills are. He journeys closer and closer to the center of this story. And near these hills, he would proclaim who he is. His ministry would impact the people in that city. It's within that city in the shadows of those hills that he's crucified. That Jesus hangs on the cross and all of history is changed. Not just for the people on the inside, but people everywhere, people on the outside, people like Jerome hundreds of years later are impacted by his story. 
by what he does and by his ministry and by his life. We're reminded of that in Ephesians 2 as Paul writes these words. But now in Jesus Christ, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. This is something that is written to all of us, and I think all of us can identify with that story of being on the outskirts of something at some point in time. And all of us are on that pilgrimage somewhere, either on the outside or working our way towards the inner part of this story where we all encounter Jesus, where we learn what his blood does for us. No matter who we are, no matter where we're from, no matter what our story is, the blood of Jesus does the same for all of us. It puts us at the center of God's story. In verse 14 and 15 it says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law when it commands and its regulations. His purpose was to create himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. By which he put to death their hostility. He came and he preached peace to you who were far away. And a peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. This is some of the greatest news that has ever happened in the history of mankind. I'm sure as these words were being written by Paul, as Jerome possibly translates these, they touch his heart in a special way, being on the outside and receiving God's peace, receiving God's grace, knowing how these words might transform somebody else's life. Continuing on, it says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. This paints this picture so prominently that Jesus is the center of all of history. That it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you are from, no one is a foreigner to God, no one is a stranger to God. But we are all fellow citizens with God's people. We are members of his household and that is something that bonds and brings us all together here today. Even though we come from different places, even though we have been outsiders in different places, when we come into this space, when we come into this building, when we open up God's word, when we look and see God's truth, we're reminded that we are all fellow citizens. We're all in the same boat. We're all part of God's central story. And in 21 and 22, it says, In him the whole building is joined together and it rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So not only are we welcomed in, we're part of the building up of the church. He uses us as outsiders to become central to the building of something better the building of his community, the building of his church, the building of his kingdom by being and allowing God to dwell in us. I think that's part of all of our journeys when we're on the outside, but when we finally have the Holy Spirit dwell in us, it changes everything about our story. It allows us to connect with God. It allows us to feel like we are part of something bigger, that we have a place, that we have a role. And it puts us in this place of our pilgrimage to come into this holy place that God has given to us. 
I think a lot of us seek and search for that in different ways, in different places, and sometimes it requires us to come into a place like this. For others, we get the experience of going to places like Israel. We all connect and are connected to God in different ways. But I will tell you this in my own personal life, there has always been a magnetism towards the Holy Land, to Israel, something that even as a young child I wanted to go there, I wanted to build pilgrimage there, I wanted to walk where Jesus walked, I wanted to be close to where Jesus was. To be able to touch the places that maybe possibly he was born. To touch the stones that he walked on. To see the places where he was crucified and where he was laid and where he was resurrected. Because that's why people are drawn to the places where God reveals himself. I wanted to be where God has revealed himself. I wanted to be drawn to the places where God promises people that he is at. To be drawn to the places where Jesus changed all of history something unexplainable but ultimately attainable for everybody you know part of the story of jerome is he was drawn to that place he was drawn to this location in his life and in his pilgrimage and it probably took him a lot longer than it took me i'm fortunate live i get on i had an uncomfortable 10 hour flip plane ride but he had a lifelong dedication to travel to this place and as he dedicated his life to transforming the Bible, he was drawn in that, to that magnetism of what Bethlehem might have been. He was drawn to the place where he knew his Savior had been. And in this place where he translated the Latin Vulgate, where he translated the Bible, one of the most interesting things and fascinating things to me this person who was smart, who was knowledgeable, who was on this pilgrimage and was living a life of asceticism, he could have lived anywhere he wanted. He could have set up shop anywhere he wanted in the world and being funded. But as he chose his location to translate the Bible, the place that he chose beyond this wall, around the corner, is another place that is even more famous, a little more special. And that is... That within walking distance, within the hallways, is this place, and it doesn't look like much unless you've been there also, but supposedly that rock within the circle is part of the bedrock of where Jesus was born, part of the, the cave where Jesus was born in. And so uh, Jerome chose to be within walking distance, within the labyrinth walk, in a short walk of where Jesus was claimed to have been born because he was drawn close to where God was, to where Jesus was. He wanted to be as close to God in that special place as possible to write down and write and be transformed and to translate something that is even more special, the scriptures and the truth of God. That's what was special about this place where he chose. That's why he wanted to be there is because he wanted to be as close to where Jesus was as possible he was somebody who moved to the outer edge to the most inner uh, circles to do something that would transform people from generation to generation century to century he chose to be connected to the birthplace of jesus because he wanted to be as close to that space as possible and his story of moving from the edge to the center came to israel he wanted to write he wanted to help others go from the edge that he was at to the center of connectedness to a relationship with God. You know, there's something special about, even if it's not the real place, being able to kneel down and touch a space that is claimed to have been where Jesus was born. There's that draw to it. And getting to experience that, I can understand why Jerome would leave his life behind to journey there, to be as close to where Jesus is to be able to take on this monumental task of creating something that would draw people in, that allow people to have a community that he was searching for. Because even though he started his life with asceticism in Israel, eventually he figured out that living life and doing life alone wasn't something that was really that appealing and even though there was a lot of, of people that were wit like Jerome early or in the mid, in the third century who were trying to be aesthetic, 
eventually they figured out they were missing something huge and important that is part of the Christian journey, and that is community. There was this big transformation in the third century of people who were living alone and isolated on these hillsides of Bethlehem. But eventually in the fourth century, they said, we are missing community. And they started to come together and they started to meet together. They started to worship together. They started to read together and they created the first monasteries. They created the first churches in that area that would worship and be intentional about community. And his scriptures helped them to do that. That's why he wanted to pilgrimage there. It's because he knew he would transform his life. It's also why I wanted to go on a pilgrimage there. And I'm, again, grateful that I could just hop on a plane and go. Because all of history points to these places. And as you're sitting in these places, you're reminded that no matter what outer edges we've ever found ourselves, that God wants us to be part of his inner circle that we can go to the place where it all started, where he sent his son. He was willing to send him to earth to come and transform our lives, to allow our lives to be transformed by him, as we read earlier, to be able to join in a community that is different. Because ultimately, God designed things, and he designed churches. He designed us for community. And he knows that when, the, when we're in community, we are able to connect with him the most. We're able to, to go from those outer limits to being part of something here together. And it's a reminder to us, no matter how long we've been in that inner circle, that there's still people on those outer edges who need community, who need Jesus, who need his saving grace, who need his pay, peace. And that's why Paul also writes in Colossians 4, 5, and 6, Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I think when we've come into the inner circle, when the Holy Spirit has changed our lives, then it's our responsibility to help allow other people who are pilgrimaging toward that experience too. That we make the most of all those opportunities and that we treat them with grace, that we treat them with love, that we treat them with honor and respect to help them feel connected, encouraged, included. And that is our ultimate responsibility as a church, that people who pilgrimage into here seeking God would experience God's love. That's our ultimate goal as a body of believers, that God's love that we have here is something that we offer and extend to the communities that we go into, to those who are on the outer limits that we have these conversations that we share with them and that we're vulnerable because God cares about everyone no matter how far out on the outer edge they are. God sent his son Jesus to die for everyone and God's love is an offer to identify with them, to treat them like insiders, to bring them into community. And God's love is extending and allows us to extend that privilege across all sorts of different things. Because all of human life, all of our experiences, all of our innerness begins when God's love permeates our hearts and our minds. When God's peace overwhelms us and we are allowed to live in his community. God has created us all with the opportunity to share his great love to others. While we were still sinners, he died for us. God's love came at a cost. His only son had to suffer and die so that we might have peace once again at God's table. And we need to share that with others and allow that to transform others just as it has transformed our lives. There, I heard a story, I read about the story this week of an example of what sharing God's love should look like. There was a story about these couple named Reuben and, Reuben and Sonia, and they were a homeless couple in their 20s. 
They showed up to a church one Friday afternoon. They were asking for help. They were asking for food. They were living uh, in their van with an infant. And they went and they approached someone from the church. And uh, the person was gracious and loving and kind and got them vouchers for food and got them into a temporary housing. But she also did something more. In talking with them, she discovered that Reuben played the bass, and she saw it in his van, and she invited him to play with the worship band on Sunday, two days after she met him, not knowing his background, not knowing anything about him. She invited him into this community. She met those physical needs, but it put him in that spiritual place to find a place where she saw he was gifted And she didn't ask if he was a good musician. She didn't even ask if he was a good Christian. She just simply welcomed him in Jesus' name. And eventually they got connected to the church. They became regular members and began to raise their family in a new community that loved and cared about them. I think stories like that remind us that no matter where we're at, no matter who we are talking with, it's an opportunity to share God's love. Sometimes we look at people who are on the outside and it's easy to try to want to keep them there, but it's our ultimate goal is to try to bring them closer, to help them on their journey to connecting with God, to share the good news that has transformed our lives. And this is really the reminder to all of us that it doesn't matter if you're an outsider or an insider here today. We are all on a spiritual pilgrimage. We're at different places in that journey But all of our pilgrimages are about starting where we're at, and no matter how far on the edge of society we might be, it's about moving towards the center of God's story with others. He might be have in store for you something that is maybe seemingly unremarkable to others, but God might be trying to do something remarkable through you and change the lives of those around you in remarkable and incredible and impactful ways. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you do in our lives. Lord, I thank you for seeing us while we are still on the outside, for caring about us. when We've done lots of things that we probably are guilty of, things that we regret, things that weigh on our conscience. Lord, I pray that it's like Jerome, that even in those moments that you would send your spirit to convict us, to challenge us so that we can change and become in a deeper relationship with you. Lord, I know that we all feel like we're on the outside at some point, and it's not a feeling that we like. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that Jesus, your son, allows us to feel like we are in your inner circle, that you love us, that you care about us. And Lord, we're just part of this world that you've created, where time and time again, you use people on the outer limits to do incredible things. And you invite them to the innermost parts of your life, of your ministry, of your kingdom. Lord, I pray that we would be used by you and help others to be used by you as well. Lord, thank you for loving us and allowing us to go on a spiritual journey with you in our lives and that your spirit would lead and guide us. Lord, allow your spirit to fill this place, to change lives, and to help them to experience your love. In Jesus' name, amen.